Um, all right, so um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about some implementation stuff we've done recently in our Kiama library. Um, how many people here have used combinator libraries for pretty printing in functional languages? Okay, a few. All right. So this is this is not um, not. Uh, oops, I've got a point here. Um, this is not original to us. So there's a very interesting paper called Linear Bounded Functional Pretty Printing, which I highly recommend to you. So there's a whole host of uh, uh, work in Haskell in particular. So Hughes and Waddler and a whole bunch of other people have done various libraries for pretty printing. Um, where pretty printing is defined in a particular way, which we'll talk about in a minute, but you can think of it as the sort of the opposite of parsing. So you, you take some text, you turn it into a data structure, you want to go the other direction, you want to take the data structure, turn it back into text. So it's sometimes called unparsing for that reason. Um, these guys, um, in some sense, have sort of had the final word because they've, they've met various optimality criteria. So things like, as you're pretty printing, do you have to sort of examine the whole structure and then do some thinking and then start, pretty, uh, start printing? Or can you sort of print as you go? And they've got some nice um, properties that some of the other ones don't have. Um, this one, which I won't talk about tonight, is also interesting if you're into this sort of thing, because it talks about how to take things like expression structures in programming languages and print them out um, with parenthesization only in the places where it's needed. So it's sort of simple techniques for that, uh, that stuff. So what I'm going to tell you basically is an implementation of the stuff that's in this, this paper. Um, so what does this look like? So this is, it's all in Scala, by the way, because everyone uses Scala these days. Um, but the paper has a Haskell implementation if you want to go back, uh, back to that. Um, so this is sort of the basic, uh, the basic story. So it's like most combinator languages, there's sort of a base set of combinators that, that are the primitives. And then there's a bunch of others, which I'll show you some examples of in a minute. So the, the basic idea is we have some sort of type of documents, which is the, the representation of something that we want to pretty print. Okay, so the basic pretty printing operation is you take the thing you've got, you translate it into a doc that represents the, the pretty printed version, and then you turn the doc into text. Okay, and you use these primitives here to sort of express the document. So for example, text says I've got some piece of string and I want to just represent that in the output. Uh, line uh, says in some particular place I have a, a, a possibility of, not necessarily an actual line break. Okay? Uh, grouping interacts with lines. It says I've got this document here but inside that document, I want you to do some clever thinking about where to put the line breaks um, to make the document pretty print in a nice way. And I'll say what nice means in a minute. Um, empty is just nothing, obviously. And nesting says, take this document, D, and indent it from the current indentation level by this extra amount here, which defaults to something um, sensible. Okay, so. Oh, and there's a, there's a composition thing here. So this says if you've got a document, you can compose it with another document, basically puts them next to each other in the, in the output. Okay. So the idea is you use these primitives and ones built from these to build up a doc, and then you pass it to this pretty function uh, and give it a width. And the idea is that the pretty printing algorithm is, is going to um, pretty print this in that width by making some choices about where to put the line breaks inside groups. That's the, that's the story. Okay. So what I'll do for the rest of this is I'll show you a few more, I'll show you some examples of this and then at the end um, I'll sort of sketch some of the implementation and I'll tell you a story about why it's only a sketch um, when we get there. So I didn't uh, if you look in our library and in the papers on these sorts of things, you'll find hundreds of um, derived combinators from the basic ones. So for example, things like formatting a character, shorthands for particular characters just to make the specification read a bit ni nicely. Uh, other sort of composition operators, so things like this plus one 
is basically take the current document with a space and the other document. Okay, so you got a whole host of these. One nice one for Scala is this um, screen, string to doc. So you can, because this is implicit, you can use any string as a document, and that shortens up the specifications, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, take a value of any type. So this is the type at the top of the hierarchy in the Scala type um, uh, sub subtyping relationship, etc. So you can basically take any value and say, well, I don't care. Just do a two string on it and give me that. Is that with the string again? Yes. Because two string will give you something. It might not be something sensible, but um, this string this string primitive here is, well, it's not a primitive, is, is like text, but um, in text, you don't really want to have new lines inside the text because you want to represent them as line combinators. Whereas string, it allows the new lines to be there and it goes through and replaces them all with line things before it uh, formats it. Uh, some shorthands like enclose, for example, to put stuff around things. Parens, puts parens around things. More useful are these sorts of ones like this SSEP, which is a, is a folding kind of thing. So it takes a list of, or sequence in this case, of documents and folds them with some separator between them. And there's a whole host of different ones of those. And this product one I'll show you in a minute is, is sort of special Scala sort of one that, that um, works very nicely with case classes. So that's the sort of interface so let's have an example. So this is a very simple imperative language. I apologize for doing an imperative language at a functional programming uh, meeting. I'll show you, I can show you a demo with some lambda calculus examples in a minute. Um, but this is sort of the, the idiomatic Scala way of doing a, an algebraic data type, if you like. Um, so there's, exp there's sort of top type. There's some expressions, which are the obvious sorts of things and some statements. Again, the obvious sorts of things like sequences and assignments and so on. So what we want to do is we want to pretty print structures of this, of this type. So we write a function show here. Uh, if you wanted to, you could embed all this stuff in the classes themselves. So that would be the OO way of doing it as a method of the class. This is the more functional way is to separate it out into a separate function. Okay, so we're taking a node and returning a document, and we're just doing a, 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 a match on the, the structure, okay? So you can see, so, so if it's a number, we just use the value thing to two-string it. If it's a variable, this is a string already. So we just return the string, which implicitly gets converted into a, into a document. You're right? Okay, so this is where we, we, we're really saying text bracket s there but we don't have to say the text part because that's implicit. Um, negation, so there's a minus with, a, with the actual thing. Again, this is implicitly converted to a document and we put some parens. This version is not being um, clever about the parentheses, so it's just putting them everywhere. Um, what else? So the binary ones, there's a separate function down the bottom here that does that with some spaces and so on. Null statements turn into semicolons. Interesting ones are these sorts of things like sequences. So that's a complicated line, but what, what it's basically saying is take the sequence of statements, uh, map them into documents, so you get a sequence of documents. Use that separator thing there with lines between them. So we're gonna get pos possible line breaks between every statement. Uh, stick a line at the front so that interacts with the nesting and then put braces around it. Okay, so once you get used to reading it, it's it's not too bad. Uh, the assignment statement's pretty simple. The while loop, same sort of deal. Um, notice that we're using a group on the the sequence here, and a group on the body of the while loop. So that gives us some flexibility. So that says that in some circumstances, say a while loop might be all laid out on one line. But if it doesn't fit, it might be laid out on multiple lines, and the line breaks are going to tell us where the breaks can be. 
Yes. Uh, the, this line, yeah, will turn into space. There's another one called line break, which turns into nothing. So there's, there's many combinators for this, but this one turns into space. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, can you, can you prioritize where the line breaks go? Um, no, not usually. Um, no, I don't think so. Okay, so let's have a, a look at what this does. See if I can get this to work. I've got my laptop balanced precariously here, so try not to drop it. Um, so I'm just in the, the Scala REPL here, so I can take some stuff here. So this is the, so I don't have to type it in. So this is the pretty printer that we've just seen, essentially. Just bring that in. And this is the, can everybody read, is that big enough? You want it bigger? Okay, so that's, that's just, importing the AST classes into the REPL. And then I can take this So that mess is basically a single program. So it's a sequence with a list of assignments and things in it and so on and so forth. So this is the way that Scala would normally just print it out. Right. Um, so I can say, well, I'd rather like to see that in a nice way. So I can use my show function to convert P, that's this thing. I can use the show to convert it into a document and then pretty print the document. Okay, so you can see I've got my braces, I've got some indentation. Um, but it's decided that that while loop can all fit on that line, so it's just whacked it all on the, on the line there. Um, if I want to, I can specify a, a width to pretty, so I can say, I think something like 50 gives us something slightly different. All right, so it's sort of said, well, you know, that whole thing won't fit, so I'll just move it down. And I remember there was a nest in there, so it nested it when it split it. If I pick 30, I get that. So you can see that the line breaks are coming where we would expect them to be, but only if they're needed. And the indentation is only here. Right? The indentation's not here. It's only there when it's being applied. So it basically just says, well, I can't, there's nothing I can do. I'll, I'll go off. So it's not optimal in the sense, right? Now, it, that's partly because of the way I've specified it, right? Because when I've done the assignment statements and things, I haven't left the possibility of line breaks in these positions. But you could do that if you wanted to. So if you, if you wanted to have, you know, I equals 10 all underneath each other, you could specify that. Yes, yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so these these sorts of algorithms don't work very well if the line lengths are very short, basically. Uh, all right. Yep. Yep. So it's it's just being driven off the line length here. Uh, all right, so the, one of the things I mentioned before was this product thing. So product is a, um, products in Scala are sort of um, well, a, a, an abstraction, if you like, a bit of these case class sort of ideas. So case classes automatically inherit, uh, extend product. So it's a way of just saying we've got something and it's got a, 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 a title essentially and a bunch of values in it and you can find out how many there are and so on. So this just prints a product in a standard way. And you wouldn't believe how, how amazingly useful this is when you're building compilers and things. Just being able to lay out your data structures automatically. Um,
pretty sure. Pretty sure. Yeah, so okay. So as soon as you're fusing shell, it's deeply each shell. Okay. All right. So I think it looks at the string that real shell would have made. Yeah, it does. And it's just a yeah. 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 post process. Post process. Yeah. Yeah. It, 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 um, it's actually got a Haskell left key in the pretty shell. Mm -hmm. So just to prove you can do functional languages with this too, um, this is a very simple lambda calculus example. So there's a, a simple program there, and you can't really see what it is because you're not pretty printing it. So if we, and I won't show you the pretty printer, but it's very similar to the one that we did. Oops. Pardon me. I'm, I'm uh, typing badly. There we go. So that's the, this is sort of the pretty printed version. And as we saw before, I can, oops, for some reason, my history's gone because of the foreground. Pardon me. Yep, SBT's decided to get rid of the... Simple build tool for Scala. Oops, I got it. I'm in the wrong, sorry, I haven't gone far enough in yet. So the angle thingy is SBT's prompt, and now I need to get into the project, which for some reason takes a while. I think it must be rebuilding it, I don't know why. Apparently, apparently it's rebuilding. <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay, that's better. Um, so if I do the show, and I can do it, uh, oops, now. So the one thing about this, I don't think there's a group. No. Okay, I can't work out why that's not working. Anyway, that's not grouping, but you can do the, the product as well. Okay, does that make sense? It's pretty simple, um, pretty easy to use, standard, uh, standard sort of thing. Uh, all right, so how does it work? And I, this is gonna be very short because I basically ran out of time to and, and brain um, energy to work out a good way of explaining how this works. So I, so I started with this sort of approach of writing these, uh, of drawing these pictures, and then the pictures got way too complicated, and I had a desk full of pieces of paper with complicated things, and I thought if I put this up, no one's gonna understand it anyway. Um, so I'll just give you the basic flavor of it. So uh, uh, it's a continuation-based implementation. So if you look at the paper, um, they start out with this, the sort of high-level specification. They say, well, what's the simplest way we can do this? And they, they define a, essentially the meaning of this thing in a very s simple way, but it's a very inefficient um, mechanism. So then they set out a, a lazy um, version and the continuation-based one. And the continuation-based one has the advantage that it works in strict languages as well. So in Scala, it's, uh, it's perfect. Um, but the, the basic idea is that a document is actually um, a function that takes the sort of indentation that we're currently working with and the width, and it was a, it's a continuation transformer, if you like. Right? So this, you can think of this as the what should happen next, and this is saying, well, this document has an effect on that by producing this other continuation. Um, and if we sort of drill into what a continuation is, there's this complicated structure of, a, of the position we're currently up to and a, a doubly ended queue to remember some stuff about the groups that we've seen, but we haven't quite decided what to do with them yet. Okay, and that's the bit I'm not gonna explain because it gets complicated. The code actually in the Haskell version is only, and the Scala one as well, is not very long but it's doing, it's doing some, cl some clever things. But you can think of the tree continuation as saying, well, once, once I've got one of these, if you tell me where you're up to and what might have been sort of deferred, I can produce something that when told how much space is remaining, gives me the output. And that's the basic structure. So you can see this is the pretty 
This is the picture for the pretty case. Um, so this is the document that I'm trying to print, the whole thing. So I feed in a, an indentation of zero and the, whatever the width is that I want. And a continuation, if, I don't know how many people are used to continuations, but when you think of continuations, you start at the end and work backwards typically. So this is a continuation that ignores all of its inputs and just produces the empty string. Right, so that's the thing you want to do at the end. So you feed that in up here, and then this document sort of modifies that. This gives you the, the sort of position of zero, an empty queue, and then you feed in the width again and you get this thing. So these pictures were working, working great at this point. Okay. Um, and they worked pretty well on this slide as well. Okay. So here's empty. Doesn't care about anything, just passes its continuation through, right? That's cool. Um, nest, so we've got a document and an indentation. So if you can, I don't know if you can read that, that says plus J. So you take whatever the indentation is that we're currently working at, add J to it, feed it through the document, and the, whatever you get out is the answer, okay? Uh, and then this is the composition one. So you, you sort of feed the continuation that should join up there. You feed the continuation into the, the, the right-hand one, and the indentation and the widths go in both places, and the output of that one goes in there and comes out that way. Okay. So this is great. Um, I decided at this point not to try and draw the pictures for the other ones. Okay. And the reason is that there's quite a lot, there's quite a bit of mucking about with this w, double ended Q to keep track of what's going on. So let me just show you the, the code. You guys can read code anyway, right? So, um, yeah. So that's going to be too small for a while. So this is the Scala version. If you want to read the paper, you'll get the Haskell version. So you can see here's the pretty. So we've got the document, we've got the zero and the width, and there's the con there's the starting continuation. That's the one that doesn't do anything, which is this one here. Nothing. Zero empty Q width. So that's that's that most complicated box in the in the uh, picture. Um, empty. So there's a bit of extra stuff in here compared to the Haskell version. I've got a few extra type annotations in here to make it a bit easier to understand, but also just because Scala is not as good at inferring types. So this is the one that takes the the continuation and just passes it through. This is the nesting one. So we take the indentation and the width, and we pass into the document indentation plus the new indentation and the width. Right, so that's the structure there. Um, things get a lot more complicated after that. So um, things like group here has got some funny stuff going on with updating the continuation. So this is a thing to say when, when we sort of dealt with a group, what do we have to do to sort of clean up things and sticking things on the end of queues. So this is a Scala collection operator to stick something on the end of one of these, these queues. But it, all it, I mean, it's a bit hairy, but it's, it's not, uh, it's not a lot of code in the general thing. So this is the, um, it's the best one to look at. So text, um, there's a little short optimization here. If it's just the empty string, we just return the empty document. But otherwise, you can see sort of what's happening here, that we take the, um, the, the string, that's this T thing, and we comp concatenate that with the result of the continuation. R is the remaining space, and L is the length of T. So in other words, we chew up L more characters, and then we just call the continuation, essentially. This scan thing is sort of keeping track of groups that we've passed over, but we might be able to process now. And it's used down here as well in the in the line case. The line case is the complicated one because it's got to think about whether we're going horizontally or vertically. And so there's a choice here. Um, 
So if we're going vert vertically, a line turns into a new line and some indentation, which is this, this expression here, plus the continuation. Yeah they, <laughs> yeah, they have, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that, that just duplicates that string that many times. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm sure it wasn't original in Scala. Um, oh, and there's the, <laughs> this is the concatenation, so it's just a composition of the two functions, okay. And the rest of it was all this hairy stuff up here, which I decided not to try and explain. But that's that's it, basically. So there's a few type declarations at the top. Down below where you have n properties of some sort of property. Yeah, um, that's the best one. Is this just a uh, data question, kind of a function with an indentation? Is there any between? Is that the difference? Is that not a two-parameter function because you need to pass it as byte or something? Yeah. So that's one of the one of the challenges with this thing. So partial application in Scala requires you to actually um, identify the piece, the argument yeah. segments that you want to partially apply. Whereas in the in the Haskell one, you can do anything you like, right? So in this one, I've I've sort of yeah, essentially, yeah. So you can see that you can see it down here as well. So this the document is taking one argument, which is a tuple. And then another argument, which is the continuation. So these are separate argument lists. So I can apply a document just to that bit if I want, and then apply the the continuation later. But I can't apply that. I can't apply it to that number, and apply the width later because these are one argument. So it's that that was actually the sort of messiest bit of the whole the whole thing. Yep. Uh, it has to be in parens. So the argument lists always have parentheses around them. Yep. So if you look at the, so remember D is a doc, right? So a doc is a, um, so it's a, yeah, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but the, you can see here we've got the, the currying being expressed in the type here. So the input, the indent and the width is one argument, the continuation is another, and so on. You can see these, these are together, whereas these are separate. So there was a bit of fiddling to get that right. But, um. Since the indent and the width are, are never going to change, can it be an implicit parameter somewhere? Uh, yeah, probably. So my, so the question, I keep forgetting to re re to repeat the question. So the question is, could, could the, the indentation and the width be implicit? Um, probably, but I wanted to duplicate the functional Haskell implementation as closely as possible so that I could get it right. There's probably optimizations you could do with this to, to simplify things. But I, that's why some of this stuff is a little bit funny, might not sort of be sort of idiomatic Scala because I wanted to try and get it as close to the Haskell as, as possible. Yeah. And the composition DQ goes uh, out. Uh -huh. With the composition DQ, is that a tuple or is that an argument list? Can you store that position, comma DQ in a structure, or is it different? It's 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 a tuple, essentially. Um, there's a bit of a um, yeah. There's kind of a funny relationship between tuples and argument lists, and in, in then there's some automatic conversions between them and stuff that confuses people a bit. It's a, it's a function that's taking a, a tuple and returning this thing. Um. So is a is a so we have prune C. Is that C being wrapped up in a one tuple? Can you pass it to something? Uh, well. But you, you do have this funny thing where if you've got a function that takes a tuple as an argument, it's sometimes a bit hard to tell the difference between that and a function that takes two things. 
and some you sort of tempted to write paren paren x comma y paren paren but in fact most cases you don't need to and it sort of automatically works so it's it's a bit of a wart in the language um, hmm? oh of course yeah yeah, yeah. Um, all right that's kind of all I had to say so uh, put up my final slide if you actually care about this stuff, it's all in the current release of the Kaima library, so you can download it tonight and start playing. So, so why, why did you do it? Just to help you with the rest of your work and change trees and things like that? Yeah, so motivation was that we, I mean, we're building compilers and language processes and things, and you always want to print stuff out and see what they look like. Um, particularly if you're actually translating to some programming language, then you want to pretty print the programming language you get out. And this makes it very easy to essentially declaratively specify what the output should look like. And that paper was the state of the art? Uh, that's the, so when I went looking around, I, I mean, there's obviously lots of famous papers by Hughes and Wadler, and there's piles of them if you look in this, this thing. But this, this seemed to be sort of the end of that chain. And they sort of said, yep, we've done it. That's it. I don't think it's the last paper that will get published, but it's a it's a pretty short paper and it's it's a functional pearl in JFP so it's it's only 15 pages or something and gets right down to it has all the code. And do you see anything you would like to improve in the future that are missing? Or? No, I mean w one of the things about combinator libraries is you never know whether you've got the right combinators. So all these separated list combinators and you know th so we're. I think we've probably converged a bit now, but we, for a while we were sort of, every time we did something, we said, oh, well, I really need one of those, and added another one. So there's a whole host of them. I mean, I showed you SSEP, but there's about eight or nine that do slightly different things and fold in different ways and things. And, but of course, you can write your own. They're, they're one line, essentially. So it's very easy to do, you, do it yourself. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I mean, it's, I don't know how to summarize that question, but yeah, the, the, the question is sort of about what's the, what is the optimality guarantee that is being provided here? And it, it's not so much the efficiency per se, I don't think it's more the, the how much of the input do you have to look at to produce some output kind of one. So. There's a whole bunch of these things around, and you have, and a lot of them, you have to basically do this operation on the whole of this huge data structure, and then go, all right, I think I know what to do, and then start printing. This one has the guarantee that you can start printing. Now, if you start, if you decide that something has to be done a particular way, you do that first, and then you don't have to have thought about the rest, right? And that they call it optimally bounded or s something like that, and you only have to go through everything once, basically. There's no backtracking. Um, I, is pretty pretty easier than parsing? I, don't, I mean, I, I think it depends because this is a pretty, well, this is a particular view of what pretty printing is. So there are other, you could imagine other constraints that you might want to satisfy, and that would m entail a different design. One, so. uh, what is what you print pretty print is not compatible anymore. So how can you make sure that what you pretty print is in accordance to the, the language specification? Can you derive some pretty printer at, out of the language specification directly? Uh, so can you can you guarantee that the output is semantically?
Yeah, but I mean the problem. The problem. But I mean, to put this syntactically correct is easier than semantically correct, right? Because otherwise, you'd have to have a semantic model of your language and and have. have <laughs> well, you prove it in cock first, and then. Um, but I think that's yeah, that's a general problem. Right? I mean, the the advantage I guess of this is that you don't you don't have sort of ad hoc. Um, printing code all over the place, you, you write one pretty printer and if you forget to put a semicolon in where there should be one, you fix it, put it in, and then everybody everybody gets printed with semicolons at that point. So, um, you can, so this, if you take a step back before this doc, so this doc representation is intended to be just of a pretty printed document, but the one before that you would hope would be some representation that stops you from expressing things that you don't want to express. So it's, a, it's an abstract syntax for the output language, right? And so that, that, that happens before you get to this, this stage. All right, thank you very much. Thanks, Tony. Okay.